Hey, hello everybody. We here. Fine, thanks for joining. We got a live episode going. And when I say we, talk about me, the Borbo breeder, just a guy that's been breeding Borbos for 15 years. I'm not an expert. I just been hands on with these dogs every single day for the past six hours today. I don't know how many hours I spent with the dogs, 24 hours of the day. But we here, we're going to discuss today, we're discussing dog organizations, AKC, the SABT. Uh, the NKC, uh, eight NABA, SABBS. We discussing the breed organizations, they roll, uh, what we subscribe to, our thoughts on the breed organizations, what we think that they need to be doing next. Um, so we're gonna have a really interesting discussion. We again, we always putting the dogs first, putting our best foot forward doing our best to keep it informative. We want to make sure that, hey, we speak in facts. Everything that we saying is based off of our experience. And we want you to feel, we want to get your thoughts too. Uh, I'm speaking from the heart. I love dogs. Y'all know that if you don't know me. I want y'all to see my puppy. We'll go ahead and put him down now because he's got me sweating. The puppy's temperature is 101 degrees, and I'm only 98, so it's a little it's a little warm. And then, you know, if we're here in Cleveland broadcasting live. So we're going to get into this episode. First of all, I want to give you all, we got to start with the very beginning. If we're going to talk about kennel clubs, we got to start with the very first one. That's a good place to start. The very first kennel club was actually called the Kennel Club, and they originated in England sometime around 1873. And the organizers, the originators of the Kennel Club started out as like a little miniature dog club. People got together and just brought their dogs together on Sundays and let the dogs socialize and interact kind of like what they did at the dog park. And uh, sometimes people will have discussions as far as what dog was the correct dog or if this is a dash hunt, what does a dash hunt look like? And, um, oh, you're, you know, of course, people always want to beat on their chest and say, my dog is better than your dog. And this was kind of a way to set what was the right dog. So they organized this group. Uh, the first is called the Kennel Club. All of these different breeders came together and they wrote standards for their prospective breeds. Now, prior to this breed uh, kennel club, dogs were bred and selected based off of uh, performance. So you would say uh, a rat terrier was actually used for hunting rats or a coon hound was used for coon hounds and they bred and selected coon hounds based off its ability to hunt coon hounds, to hunt coons. Or the, um, so the best dog that, the best dog suited for the task ended up being bred to more often. Therefore, passing on those genetics that were invaluable to the breeder. Um, then a lot of that had to do with your location, um, the pastimes, you know, the type of game that was available in the area. And so some people, you know, some people hunt maybe in the mountains, they might hunt jaguars. Um, so you might have a different style dog for hunting jaguars than you do for hunting birds. Hey, puppy. Oh, you were looking for everyone. So getting back to these different organizations and what do they do um 
they classify your dog based off of um, rewarding, rewarding it based off of a standard. And the standard is like the breed's constitution. It, if you don't know that already, um, when people say paperwork and pedigree dogs, these are all terms that we mean different things. They can't, they kind of use interchangeably, but they all have very different meanings. So we're going to first, you got the organization. So, and then which would be like the governing agency over the breed, the prospective breed. And their job is to write the standard. And then the standard is what defines the breed. It says what characteristics that the breed should have. Um, it determines, and then a lot of it is based off of a visual um, appeal. What do, what do they thought the dog should look like visually? So what happens is at that same time, um, science, people were reading towards uh, the theories or the ideologies of a purebreds, purebred, pure race. And that's where the pedigree dogs come into. And basically a pedigree dog or a purebred dog is a dog that has been bred within the same family for a number of years. So that's that's what you what essentially what they're saying when they mention that your dog is a purebred dog. That means that it has been bred exclusively with dogs within its own family. Now, think about that. Your own family, dogs within their own family. That's the that's what the purebred dogs mean. And the science and the logic and the theories behind that is kind of uh, well said to be founded in the eugenics. At the time, um, that was the, uh, the the thought process that you know you could have pure strains and and races basically. Um, of dogs. So with that, we began to breed dogs at that time exclusively within their own families and they hadn't been done prior to that. Dogs were selected based on their ability. So that birthed the, the Kennel Club. The American Kennel Club follow suit fast forward to 1983 we got the founders of the borbo decide for whatever reason we're going to make a breed um we're going to standardize our breed and it had to do with a lot of the time with the, the climate um the farmers were said to be looking for ways to supplement their income uh post apartheid that they thought they were worried um the apartheid was ending um, we were beginning to unravel uh, at that time. It was a hostile political climate and, um, you know, they was always being threatened with sanctions. The, the, the farmers livelihood was, you know, they, they looked for ways to supplement their incomes is what I read. And then they birthed the horrible breed and the breed was designed for the export market. This was, uh, an exclusive, well, you know, something that dogs that uh, South Africa farmers could benefit from based off of their ability to export the dogs to the international market for, let's say, the European or the American dollar, which would be significantly higher in value than the South African rand. So we're talking about something very lucrative for the South African borbo farmer. And this was supposed to design. Remember, South African zone, um, the Borbo is part of the word, literally means farmer's dog, right? So this is the farmer's dog breed. And because of the farmers supplementing their income, you got, and that's where, that's where people always go wrong. And that's why I always tend to look past the dollar because I know that that could make you lose focus of what's really important. And with the organizations, that's that that's what the, at the beginning they meant well, I'm sure that they did. They had no idea that a um, hundred years later or 25 years later, we will be seeing uh, dogs suffering or people suffering with their dogs and not happy with their lifespans and 
dogs unable to perform and it's a whole uh bunch of controversies surrounding dogs that um supposedly have been facing genetic bottlenecks um because of the closed gene pools and as a result of the closed gene pools you're seeing um life expectancies being shortened decreases in fertility you see in unnatural births and a host of genetic defects and dogs weren't like that before so we really had to look at why is this happening um so one of the biggest reasons that it happens is due to the closed gene pool and i mean science has proven that that leads to inbreeding depression and you'll see that in societies that um have like a closed gene pool and it results in high mortality rates and so on so why is that a problem for the world now how does that relate to the border so let's get back to the border and the south african farmer the south african farmer the original breed organization starts out with 72 borbles that go on a quest to find the best dogs in the nation. That's what the, the, the legends have, have it being told by the legends. 72 dogs. From those 72, we have a select few that were sought after that became recognized as dogs that could produce the type of dog that we feel should be promoted internationally. Those dogs began, then we start to see the line breeding. This is said to be a way um, dog breeders, this is a way that dog breeders, not said to be, it's a way that dog breeders fix tight and make the dogs all kind of look the same way. And that's the goal with the closed family to re, re, to create a pure breed of dogs that will clone or breed true to the type. Now, with South African Borbos being a newly designed breed, if they send these dogs overseas, when they send the dogs overseas, and they send the registration documents and leave it to the foreign registration organizations, foreign registry organizations, then the breed is no longer being governed by South Africans and they lose their control over the direction of the breed's refinement with a new breed. So they have um, something that was unique for the time breed appraisals and i thought hey that sounds really good i mean in the beginning uh as a novice to the breed i thought that the appraisal thing was a, like a great idea um because you're going to have the dog being evaluated and i felt that that lended credibility to the dog because it had been evaluated so i was like really eager to participate with the appraisals and um you know i thought well, wow that's really clever and it makes sense because if the dogs get over here how do we determine what dog is a borbo or what dog isn't a borbo? So uh, you go, you, what the appraisal is, it is an evaluation of your dog. They come over, they take a look at your dog. Uh, they send a person from South Africa, supposed to be a breed expert. And then they're going to give a, they basically walk around um, looking at the dog. And then they're going to give the dog a value based off of what they see that, dog how close does it mimic the standard or what how close is it to the ideal so that's fine and dandy that is a good way to refine the look of the dogs and uh, so in the beginning i was enthusiastic and easy eager to participate. I went to the appraisals and um, I kind of started to learn 
more about the breed and you know one of the biggest benefits is the networking potential from going to these different events a lot of people are going to bring the dogs that they feel are good dogs to the event and give you a chance to meet some of the best dogs and that's a good reason to go if you're into dogs um so, it's, so a person like myself you know i'm always chasing the dogs i want to see who got what and then i want to meet people that's also like myself that's interested in the dogs so dog shows are a great place for that now the problem with the dog shows is you know it's like a money grab when you walk away with the highest score um you can walk away with potentially you know a dog that is sought after and it, and it makes sense you know higher score equals better dog quote unquote that's but the problem with that is that is not how it tends to go and the dog shows at the appraisals in my experience it they're appraising the dog based off the person right and that's not fair to the dogs and it's not really measurable it's not something that um because you can take the dog from appraisal to appraisal and they're going to get different scores or depending on who's handling the dog when it's being showed they're going to get different scores because it's all based off of opinion and it's all based off of who what that person feels at the moment the quote-unquote appraiser or the governor and um so I, as a man you know, as a boy, I thought this, you know, I've always had an issue with somebody telling me what I feel is right is what I feel is right. And nobody going to tell me different because I know that I'm a fair person and that's just how that I am. And I feel like what I, what I witnessed is uh, politics. You know, like I said before, the lady told that, um appraisal that I was a bad boy you know what I'm saying and that hey how you feel about me personally ain't got nothing to do with this dog why are you saying that to the appraisal this is Shirley Hackler from the um and so let's get this get it let's move on to that so um the as, because the Borbo breed organizations is very lucrative to the South African farmer they couldn't agree on who's got the best dog that's what these shows are about, determining whose dog is the best dog. So what happens is you get a split. All of these different organizations, Historical Borbo Association of South Africa, the SABT, Borbo International, uh, IBASA. you got all of these different organizations that are really founded by breeders, okay? Breeders make these different clubs up, and then these dogs, uh, they, they try to promote are their own dogs. That's the dog that they feel is the right dog. The dog that I'm breeding. That's the dog that's the best dog for you. Or that's the dog that's going to be winning. So you got six or seven different organizations governing this so-called one breed that was supposedly uh, have one breed standard that all of these people agreed on. That wasn't the case. So now the best dog I feel is always going to sell. I'm going to always have to try to breed to the best dogs that I can find. I don't care nothing about um, which, what I want the best of the best. You understand? Uh, and considering what I want the best dogs that I could possibly have in the nation, and period, die. That's just, this is, this just sum it up like that. Now, not i'm not getting into who was last year's champion i'm not getting into what the dog scored because i see some dogs score high that i don't like and i see some dogs score low that i do like and i see some dogs that scored accurately i don't it's hard to really uh get a gauge on the scoring because the borbo has so many different types what attracted me to the breed was the variation you got so many different styles to choose from you got all of these different flavors and i feel like spice is the flavor is the spice of life all right when you got all of these different flavors you got these different dogs you can really get exactly what you want and what i want might not be what you want and that's fair we different people we gotta respect each other's opinions all right Let's get an accurate way to measure these dogs, though. So let me get back to these organizations. They split up, 
right? When the black or borbles was uh, introduced into the breed, they they slipped them in, calling them ultra brindles. So you got these uh, people saying, hold on, you know, y'all, hey, they called the police on them, so to speak, and, and filed a lawsuit and then said that black borbles is illegal. That's how gangster that the South African government is. Hey, put a stop to this. That's how much money can make things move in South Africa. And now I'm going to say, hey, you know what they was telling me to stop? I'm going to keep it how I, I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. It's my show, how, how my perspective. This is exactly from what I witnessed. That's how shrewd the government is. They stepped in and said, no more exporting of these dogs. We got to determine who is pure and what's not. And eventually it was determined, it was overwritten that the black borble was allowed, was accepted. It was a real borble and they had to include it into the breed standard. So you got like a floating breed standard. People in America were upset. They decided, uh, the lady that formed the American Borble Club, Pam Sefner, I talked to her personally and I uh, got her thoughts on the um, borbles, the black borbos. She didn't agree with the black borbos. She felt that they were some form of um, breeders, dogs that they didn't have any history. She felt that it was unfair to include them. She had visited several farms in South Africa and um, I, I, she had passed away, but she was tenacious. I respected her. Um, she, she stood for what she stood for. She was an advocate for the breed. She wasn't really looking for her, you know, she, she was well off. She was an advocate for the breed and responsible owner. She was really a truly a good person for the breed. She founded the American Borbo Club and the American Borbo Club with their, they uh, introduced their the parent club for the AKC. So now the AKC has um, control over the breed. That was in 2007 when they first started accepting the breed, the foundation stock. And then later the, the breed was fully recognized in 2015. So now we see an explosion of the popularity of the breed. Let's get back to these organizations. Let's not lose sight. So South Africans, they, the South African organizations, because I'm not trying to single out any group of people. We're talking about organizations, dogs. It's nothing personal. The South African organizations had to, they recognize the Black Boar Ball. Because remember, this is a very lucrative, the conversion rate is 15 to 1. So we're talking about it's a money grab. It's a big money grab. The SABT dissolved as a revol result of this uh, lawsuit, and then they re refounded themselves as the SABBS. So now we got a totally new organization, the SABBS. Um, they uh, Americans didn't feel that, or people in North America did not feel that our needs were being met by the South African breed organizations. And basically what happened in what, what happened was you have these scores elevating, right? So they kind of go what what I noticed the trend was let's say the high score for South Africa was an 86. Okay. Earlier in the year the dog called um, may score they may score dogs here in the united states we may start seeing 87s 88s then you go back over to south africa they're breeding dogs now they're getting 89s so this floating breed standard it always tends to lean towards the south africans dogs why is that because if you're getting higher scored dogs here if they're accessible and they're available in the United States, there is no reason to go and um, buy dogs from import dogs from South Africa. So what you have is people downgrading dogs in order to devalue their score, devalue them monetarily, and then put a higher value on their own dogs. Americans are not easy to... Well, I don't, can't speak for everybody, but people got hip to this 
very clever scheme. And this was one of the things that Pam had a problem with. She kind of woke me up to it too. She said they're charging 200 and something dollars for appraisals. Why? Why are they charging us that much? That's not what they cost in South Africa. Okay. That's not what they cost. And you can't justify that cost if they're taking the money back over to the breed uh, parent club in South Africa. And you're talking about a 15 to one conversion rate. So you're taking a $225 appraisal and it's $3,000 minimum of eight dogs per, per venue. You know, you're talking about a nice chunk of money. So uh, they got to keep these appraisals going over here. And uh, that is what we realized. So we formed our, the NABA. Now, my issue with the NABA is these are the same breeders. Some of them has started before, after I started. Now I got to go. Uh, I'm not, I don't, I started my own club. Since everybody's starting clubs, we got six or seven clubs over in South Africa. Why can't I start my own club? And then that's what we're doing. So I started my own club. I got people could hit me up. And they had uh, issues they wanted to know. Uh, mine was the United States Dog Title Agency. And you can look it up. It's a real thing. I did my own appraisals and everything. Everybody, anybody can start a dog organization is what I'm telling you. It's not, It's this ain't governed by no, uh, the FBI or the CIA or none of them government organizations. I started my own club and I did my own appraisals. I hired an appraiser. You know, these people hit me up. They didn't have no papers on their dogs. I said, you know what? I can get you some papers. Y'all got to get eight dogs together. Okay. You get eight dogs together and I'll bring my crew out. We'll appraise your dogs. We'll get y'all papers. We pull up to their place and they, we tell the people like this, look, these dogs are borbles or they're not no good dogs. We're going to call these C's. Okay. We wasn't get we wasn't giving out 90s and 80s and stuff. We giving A's, B's, and C's. So we tell the people like this: if y'all really want to get some good dogs, y'all need to get some A's. Now, if y'all gotta get rid of these C's because the C's don't have the high value, we use the same premise as the SADBS or the SABT or the NABA. Y'all bring y'all dogs to me, eight dogs at a time. You know what I'm saying? $375 per dog, and we're going to score them, and, and people did it. But my issue with that was, you know, I'm not a greedy person, and I'm not chasing the paper. I would like to see people do the right thing with their dogs, and the people that I was dealing with at the time refused to do that. They want to just, they want, and the eyes don't lie. When I see the dog, I can kind of tell what you've been doing with it. And I don't, I don't agree with having dogs caged up and kenneled up 24-7 used exclusively and extensively as a breeding dog. I feel like the dogs deserve a life. And uh, that's too much close to, like, imprisonment. So anybody can start a breed organization. I've been involved with the dogs. I feel like I had enough experience to know. I told the people like this, y'all got to get rid of all of these C-braid dogs. And y'all got to get y'all some A's. Now, they're going to be few and far in between, but I can get them. And I came home, and I took pictures of my dogs, and I said, now, y'all see these dogs? These are A's. These A's, they're going to cost a lot of money. And I sold them all my dogs. That was in 2015. I sold 20-something dogs, all my dogs. That's how I bought this house that I'm in here now. I sold all my dogs to the people, and I was hoping I was going to get them. To, they had farms, and they had tons of land. And um, it was, it, you know what, the, the, the problem with when you're dealing with people, the problem is people tend to get greedy. And, we, and people started making money, and they started taking money and making money and Everybody chasing a dollar, everybody trying to get rich off the dog. 
they lose sight of the goal. The goal is to elevate the dog. And I would try to institute mandatory wellness testing of the dogs. After I sold all of these A's, I sold them for uh, as breeding dogs, true to value. And the people took, I had the ideology, pardon, I had the ideology that I had the ideology that I was going to be able to do, and I'm not giving up on the organization. I hope I, I, as I learn more ways to organize and get people together, it's about once we get enough people together with the same I, ideas and thoughts, we're going to be doing the wellness testing and breed suitability testing. That's really what the breed organization should focus on. Betterment of the breed through wellness testing. They have to thoroughly evaluate working dogs. And I feel like measure them and their physical abilities, particularly with Borbles. Borbles is an athletic dog. And I'm sick of these. Well, I'm not going to say sick. Be quiet. I'm not going to say sick. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know. Can y'all hear me? Okay, yeah, y'all can't hear me good. All right. Well, I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Um, thank you for joining. I can't really, I lost my train of thought. But this is uh we're gonna go back, we're gonna re revisit this. Oh, yeah, I was I was on the um elevating the uh, breed standard. And you know, one thing that I feel is a disservice to the breed is having dogs that can't get up there and and, and breed naturally. And we're already starting to see abundance of C-sections, abundance of artificial inseminations, dogs that's uh failing to breed because of the exhaustion. These type of things end up to a decline in the overall fitness of the breed. We have to figure out a way. Well, the way that we're going to go about that is through physical testing. You cannot have a working breed without testing its ability to work in some form. And by work, I feel like at the minimum, I'm not looking. I feel like the test, we got to come up with a way. And I'm looking to hear from other breeders in and out here other people that's involved with the breed, how they feel like the board should be tested for breed suitability, because it's important. It's important um, to focus on that. What, what are we doing to vet these dogs as qualified other than their visual appeal? You know what I'm saying? That's, that's not going to maintain this breed indefinitely based off of how they look. We, you got to go for more than that. They got to be effective and they got to be at, at doing something. And that's why I'm going to always ride my dogs for, for many miles because that's the way that I evaluate their wellness and their fitness for my program. I'm always going to love a dog that is like a, takes me back to my childhood when I used to take my dog out and spend, spend you know, many corners with the dog. On He chasing me. It's like the best thing in the world. So if a dog can't do that with me, then I don't want it. And this may sound harsh, may, but it's just, if a dog falls behind a pack of dogs, he gotta be able to keep up. You gotta be able to hold your own around here. It's survival of the fittest. And that's the bottom line. It's about the best of the best. And you gotta select for the best. How are we doing that? Getting back to these breed organizations and the genetic bottlenecks. That's why you see well, uh, in my program, you're not going to see uh, with the modern dogs that we're breeding, you're not going to see a whole lot of uh, 
line, close line breedings and breedings, half brother, sister, father to the son, father to the daughter, um, aunts to the, we just, just tend to not do that. So I appreciate y'all for joining because we, we feel like this doesn't benefit the dogs to abilities. We appreciate y'all for joining. I hope that y'all found this informative and uh, valuable. Um, I hope that y'all got a little bit more information about how we feel about the breed organizations. Not only did we found it our own organization, um, that's not the only organization that we registered with. And we're gonna get that kicked back up. We had to let it dissolve because of the, you know, the way that it was going. People got greedy. It was a lot of, it was a lot of uh, it was too much being made. I can't, I'm not, I was a bit originator and I'm not gonna um, uh, subscribe to the dogs being, I'm not gonna let people sell the dogs out no kind of way. So the organization, I gotta find some more partners and I'm looking for some partners that's passionate and heavily involved with the dogs. If y'all have, y'all know anybody or you interested, don't hesitate to, to reach out to us. Um, we would love to have you and, you know, especially if you all about the dogs, we going to be, we all about the dogs. So we could, we should definitely be able to agree on some things and have some things to talk about. So I'm just giving it to y'all raw, real and uncut how I am. Um, just telling it, I'm telling it from what I know, I'm not going to tell you anything that I'm guessing that this is either things that I have witnessed lived through in my own experience and that's how i'm speaking based off my experience is this is all facts as far as i know i'm not going to speak on things that i don't know and within this breed you're going to start to see a lot of these dogs is just getting exaggerated and that doesn't benefit us long term Thank you for joining. Don't forget to hit up the website if you're interested in learning more about what we got going on. Um, we're going to be going live 7 o'clock on Thursdays. We got tons of episodes dropping on during the week. Going to be editing up some videos, putting them, posting the videos. We got some more videos coming out with the puppies. Um, we're going to be going over supplies. Look for the supply video coming out soon going over we got a whole slew of supplies that we don't use and we got us uh we're gonna stick to what goes into our dogs um we're gonna let y'all know exactly how we doing um and our philosophies on how to achieve success with the bigger breeds and the borbos in particular exclusively um every minute of your time i appreciate you for joining and uh i'll catch y'all on the next episode Thank you for joining, y'all. I really uh, appreciate you. I'm out. No rush, go and move dumb. Back and forth, push and shove. Make your peace and love turn to peace and gloves. Now you got a deal run up. No rush, go